transition movement is a movement from a fossil fuel dependent society to one that isn't. So that's where the transition comes in. Um, and I think we probably all know how good growing veg is for um, the climate because we're, shot, we're sourcing our food as local as possible. We're possibly not even getting any for, um, food miles. Um, we can choose to grow organic, which is obviously the best in terms of nature and soil. Um, and um, we're not importing food from God knows where. Um, and we're normally cooking ourselves as well. So all of those things, and we're not having packaging, plastic packaging. And actually all of those things combined, the transport, the refrigeration, the ploughing and all that actually add up to about half of the global greenhouse gas emissions that um, humans emit. So actually growing your own veg is probably one of the best things that you can do for the for the climate and the planet. So hooray <laughs> as well and everyone. Um, <laughs> so um, that's that's where I'm coming from is essentially um, trying to help with um, slowing climate change. Um, and the group that I'm in started in 2008. Um, and I started growing veg, I think, in about 2004. Um, and so essentially at the beginning of where we were finding our feet, I said, oh, I'll do some veg talks because I would um, essentially maybe not because I'm the most knowledgeable person, but just because I was willing. Um, and so I've ended up with eight years experience doing the talks. Um, but every year I change them slightly and I add things to the notes because I think as gardeners we never know everything um, and there is actually a lot of conflicting information out there as well um, so at any point if somebody actually properly disagrees with me and would like to say no that's not right or in my experience I've found something different then please feel free because I'm you know willing to accept um uh, new information and quite often during these talks I learn think new things as well. Um, so um, before we go to the screen share and go through the slideshow, um, can I just find out a bit more about what sort of plot you have um, for growing vegetables? Um, so can you raise your hand if you have an allotment? Uh, not everyone actually that's maybe not even half i'm seeing i think um so um can you raise your hand if you're growing veg in your garden okay so i think maybe there's a few more allotments than gardens but that might just be because of the um technical things We've got quite a lot of gardens. Okay, so the two things have slightly different challenges, so I'll try and cover both. Um, also, now can you lower your hand if you've raised it? And then can you raise your hand if you're a beginner? Okay, a lot of the people in the um, that haven't got their video on, I can't see but we've got a few beginners there. Um, and do you want to raise your hand if you've got quite a lot of experience or you're fairly experienced? Okay, so we've got a real mixed bag, I think. Um, so what I'll do when I go through the different points is I'll say whether something is more for beginners to pay attention to or whether it might be a bit more advanced. And that way for an hour and a half, you know what you can focus on a little bit more. Um, so I think I can actually just start. So um, this is what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to do um, essentially cover three areas because this is the beginning of the year. This talk's going to concentrate on what we can actually do now. And then we'll have another talk on the 16th of March, which is things that you can do after that. Um, so at this time of year, it's really too cold to be sowing a lot of seed. Um, so we need to be planning our spaces for what we're going to grow. Um, 
there's a little bit of information here about weeds and what to do with them, compost making, which is kind of a maintenance ongoing um, bit of knowledge that we all need to know. Um, and then what seeds we can actually sow now, what vegetables we can start um, growing and, and doing something with. So essentially it's those three things that we're going to cover. Um, if there's something in that list that you particularly want to um, know about, can you put in the chat function what you would like to hear about um, and then Anita will tell me if there's particular interest in an area. Okay, does that give everyone enough, enough of a pause? Sorry, I know it's a little bit difficult sometimes typing when you're listening. Um, so uh, the first thing to do when you're planning your area is actually figure out where it is, um, which um, helps you understand the site. Um, so is it near the house, right at the bottom of the garden, at the allotment, in the neighbour's garden, under some trees or in some pots? I can't think of anywhere else you might grow, maybe the roof, roof garden, I guess. Um, but um, we've covered that there's a lot of variation between gardens and allotments. Um, but is, um, is anyone suffering from a lot of shade in their garden? Um, because essentially um, all veg is going to need tree um, sunlight, Patrick is, right. If anybody else raises their hand, have they got a lot of shade? No. Um, and is anyone just, all right, we've got two with shade. So is anyone just restricted to pots or can you actually put some in the ground? Okay, so one for pots, right. Okay. Um, so I'll cover containers. Now, I must say I don't grow a lot in containers um, because basically I'm a bit lazy and containers are completely reliant on us to provide all the nutrient food um, and everything. So I really, the main things I grow in containers are cut flowers and bulbs. So I don't have to put them in the ground and worry about putting my fork through them later on. Um, and I can force them in the polytunnel and bring them back to the garden, which is really nice. But you can grow um, veg, you can pretty much grow anything in a pot as long as you've got the um, patience to actually tend to it. Um, so you want to look at what choice of container is, whether it is um, essentially if you have a plastic pot, the benefit of that is they don't break with frost, but the disadvantage is they can get quite cold. So if it's over winter and you've got a root that needs protecting, you might need to wrap it in bubble wrap. Um, if it's frost hardy, you can actually help by raising the feet off the ground so the water drains out so that if, it, if it's terracotta, it's less likely to break. Um, filling the pots, you I think you don't really want to put too much like manure, fresh manure in there because it will heat up and that's not good for in a pot. So anything well rotted, garden made compost, shop bought compost, municipal compost, bit of soil, all of those things are fine for filling the pots. Um, and I tend to um, try and mix it up a bit. I think you've got benefits of each thing. Um, you can't just grow in municipal compost because it's too strong. Um, and actually it's quite light and friable and the water falls through it. Um, with soil, you actually um, get a little bit of benefit from the life in the soil, the fungi and bacteria. So apart from the fact you might have some weeds in it, it's not a bad thing to put some soil in there. Um, if you're growing in pots, then also think about the rotation. If we're going to come to that later, but not using the same soil every year is important. Um, you can get um, vine weevils, is it, that um, go in pots. So you need to, if you do use them the following year, check they haven't got any um, maggots in there and take them out because they'll eat the roots of your crops. Um, and some crops are going to be better than others. Um, and like I said earlier, you've got to make sure that you're watering and feeding them well. Okay, so these are some pictures of pots from some of our members. Um, you can see two pots of carrots. Now carrots are great to grow in pots. Um, 
that's partly because they get carrot root fly. And if you can see on the bottom left picture that my cursor's on, um, that's actually on top of a water butt. So it's a good sort of four or five foot off the ground. Um, and I found fantastic carrots this year um, using those pots. Um, Andy, um, who's also in our group, used pots as well um, and showed me a picture the other day with the really good harvest that she had from a September sowing. Um, and lettuce is great in pots because you can put either copper tape to prevent slugs going up there, or you can um, actually get pots that have a rough texture that stop slugs going up the side of the pots. And they might not be quite so pretty, but I've got some now and I'm hoping that I might actually be able to grow mint in my garden. Now people say that mint is the easiest thing in the world, but I find it gets eaten by slugs like anything. So I'm hoping putting it in one of those rough pots will help. I got it from my mother-in-law and apparently it's good for hostas as well. So I'll trust her. Um, potatoes can be good in pots as well. You just need one, maximum two in a pot. Don't overload it with seed potatoes. Um, you can put the potato at the bottom of the pot and then keep putting compost on the top as it grows. Um, and just make sure you water and feed them well. Um, potatoes are really hungry plants. Um, so this is my, one of my main pots that I have is essentially a roof garden. Um, now this is over a log store. Um, I started off, we are going to come to protecting your crops later, but while I've got the picture there, I'll say I started off with lettuce in this bed. You can see there's some spring onions and actually Chinese celery was really good in this bed. Um, I've got my two layers of copper tape to stop the slugs getting in. But I found the main problem with this was cats pooing in it. <laughs> so you can see my netting and sticks on this uh, left hand picture trying to keep the cats off but I actually found um, in the end the cats won um, but that was before I got a cat scarer which is a little um, gadget that puts a ultrasonic sort of um, noise when it, they cross the beam and actually that sorted out the problem but I'd already planted the um, sedums by then so you know I think those if you've got something like this then um, those cat scarers are very good. Um, so this is how I made it, which is actually very similar to any any pot. So the carpet was so that the stones didn't, you know, damage the pond liner. Um, this is just leftover pond liner that I had, and that's just simply because it's a log store. Um, and then the gravel in the bottom, if you've got a normal pot, a normal shaped pot, you need to make sure that the um, drainage holes aren't going to get blocked. So having some crocs in the bottom, which can be broken bits of pot or gravel um, just helps stop the um, holes in the bottom being blocked. And I did actually do holes in the lower side. It's a sloping roof, you can't really see from there. Um, and the holes are in the bottom side. Um, and then I just topped it off with compost. Okay, so um, any questions about containers? Uh, we've got a lot of people interested in slugs, though. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, but I think you're going to come on to that. I am going to come on to protecting your crops at the end. Um, but slugs in a back garden, I think the main difference between a back garden and an allotment is slugs. Um, and they generally like perennial cover. Um, so if you've got, if with an allotment, you dig it all over sometimes, or you at least clear all the... Um, the stuff, the plants, and you have less things like bushes and perennial plants as well. And so there's less places for the slugs to hide. And I find that I've got a lot more birds at the allotment than in the garden because we've got so many cats in the neighborhood. So I think um, encouraging birds into your garden is a really good thing. Um, and also putting holes in your fences and having um, access for slow worms and hedgehogs is really good as well because they all eat slugs. Um, and um, actually last year I planted a load of wildflower cornfield annuals and the slugs like that better than the lettuce. So this year I'm going to mix the two seeds together and sprinkle them in the garden and see whether there's some sacrificial plants that the slugs will eat. But um, <clears throat> normally in a, in a talk I'd be able to find out anybody else's tips on slugs. So um, maybe if you've got any um, tips that you find work, you put them in the chat function now 
Um, hopefully Anita will remember and we can come back to them later when we're talking about slugs. Is that okay? <laughs> if anyone has used nematodes against slugs in raised beds, then that would be good. And Jane uses a lot of sacrificial plants. Comfrey leaves are good. Lovely. Yeah, I've used nematodes as well. They're particularly good in pots. They don't tend to work in a massive garden. I think they're good in a confined area, um, especially like that roof garden and things. Okay, so um, shade tolerant plants. So I said before that essentially vegetables are going to like a lot of sun. Um, if you if when you're planning your garden, look at where the sun falls and you might feel that it's the best bit of the garden to put your vegetables in the sun, but vegetables can be really beautiful as well. And they don't have to be put in a corner. And if your only corner is shady, you're not gonna get a lot of success um, in comparison to just putting the vegetables in the place where they wanna be, which is in the sun. It's fine to get some shade during the day, but you probably want to grow where you've got more than half the day is sun. Um, there are some things that grow well in shade, um, so in the spring, you can grow lettuce and things in the sun and they're fine. And sometimes in the autumn as well, but in the middle of the summer, they bolt because they get too hot and too dry. So if you've got pots and you can move things around, you can actually start them off in the sun. And then when it gets really hot, just move them to the shade. Um, and things that are good for that, are all your leafy salads. Um, because the more shade they have, the bigger the leaves they grow because they're trying to get more sunlight um, up to a point where they then don't have enough sunlight to grow um, enough. Um, red currants are better than black currants in shade, um, but gooseberries will um, tolerate some shade as well. Black currants will be okay in a bit of shade. Morello cherries are great on a north facing wall. If you've got a fence or a wall you don't know what to do with, a uh, fan train Morello cherry is brilliant. Um, so that's really helpful for like the side of your shed or something like that. Um, if you're planning on where to put things that don't need sunlight, um, a shed and a water butt doesn't really need sunlight. In fact, a water butt will be better for not being in sun because you won't get as much algae growing in it. Compost bins quite like a bit of sun as well. So I hope that helps with them um, planning out your garden. Does, has anybody got any questions on shade? No? No. Okay, I will carry on. Um, so um, if it's your first year or you're a beginner or you don't have a lot of room, Narrowing down what you actually want to grow is quite a good idea, um, but not narrowing it down so much that you don't have choice. Because if we have a wide spread of things that we're growing, then it, you're more likely to get something that grows well. Um, normally on a year, you'll find that one thing doesn't grow well and you'll speak to other people and everybody's finding it's a bad year for X, Y and Z. Um, so having a few different things is really good, but just don't overwhelm yourself, I think. Um, so think about what will be the most benefit to grow. So um, do you want to stick with things that are the easiest things to grow? And I will cover this when we um, go through um, the different things. Are you looking to be self-sufficient, in which case yield is really important? Um, and obviously what you like. So um, I would say things that are really easy are, well, pretty easy and high yielding are beans, potatoes, squash are pretty easy, um, beetroot are really easy, I think. Um, things that give a really high yield would be, well, all of those. Brassicas, actually, if you do cons consecutive sowings, then they can give quite a high yield per area. Um, but if you choose the right varieties, uh, so I can come on to that in the next talk. If you get ones that mature quickly, you'll obviously get more yield per area and they can mature in about three months. But if you choose ones that have to wait a whole year to um, harvest, if you plant them in March and then they're not ready in, until October, which tend to be the storing ones, then the yield's not so good. 
um, you might want to think if you if you're growing in your garden and you're using the best sunny spot, what's pretty? So you can choose, say, two or three different types of climbing bean that all have different coloured flowers. Or you could um, choose different coloured leaves for your chard or um, stems. You have something called rainbow chard and that can look really nice. Um, I really enjoyed sweet corn in my garden um, because I've got a bit of a prairie garden wildflower thing going on in my garden. And actually the sweet corn worked really well with some tall grasses. Um, so the potager style, I don't think I'm saying that right, I'm saying it how it's spelled, um, is a way of designing your garden so it's pretty and actually mixing everything up with your flowers in a kind of higgledy-piggledy way is a little bit more difficult to harvest but it can actually be better for preventing infestation of some sort of insect because it's called a polyculture when you mix loads of things together um, and being next to flowers you'll get good pollination so there's um, as I go through the talk hopefully I'll be able to highlight things that maybe fit with that but that's a good thing to think about is there any questions on that bit no um, okay so choosing seed um, this is I love a seed catalogue um, and sometimes it's a bit hit and miss what you get but um, if you're looking to just you're quite happy to buy seed every year and you want something that's got really good disease resistance really good yield um, then f1s are pretty good there's some types of f1 that i really like like thor um, pepper is just so high yielding it's reliable um, and i like esos e s e o s um, God knows how you say that, broccoli um, is really good, but you can't really save the seed from an F1 variety. So if you want to be really self-sufficient and save your, year, your seed every year and be um, make it as cheap as possible um, to grow veg, you probably want to go for the um, open pollinated types, which um, if you look up the real seed catalogue um, online, then they've got some good ones. Um, so yeah, again, this is choosing seed is really based on what you're looking for. And only you'll know that. Just go with what you like. And actually just go with what you fancy is fine as well. <laughs> so, you know. Um, yep. Helen, Odile is asking, what is an F1? And I'm asking you that because I don't know either. Yeah, so it's... Um, it's I think it, is, it isn't genetically modified, but they've um, pollinated them together. And so... It's basically in the hands of the seed catalogue to give you something that um, works. And if you take the seed from it, it reverts to a previous genetic um, trace back. So like the first year you might get a really good parsnip or whatever, but then year on year as you save your seed, it will almost go back to like the wild type as it were, and maybe not wild, but you know, the maybe a less good quality cultivated type so with um f1s are a reasonably new thing um so the open pollinated types are what we always used to go with um and so for sort of sustainability um protecting those um open pollinated types is important as well so yeah it's uh, to my mind there's like a a 50 50 payoff i'm not quite sure which one i like best because i do like the um, high yielding disease resistant things that you get on an F1 but then um, I'm torn to just going back to basics and saving our seed and passing them on to neighbours and how nice that is um, and not having to be reliant on a seed company to provide the seed for us so yeah I think it's up to you and having a, maybe a mixture is good as well or yeah <laughs> does that answer the question? Yeah, cool. All right, so shall I move on? Is there anything come up in the chat, Anita? No? Cool. Please feel free to ask. I feel like I'm going through maybe a bit quicker than normal because um, normally we probably spend a bit more time chatting. So do feel free to ask questions. Okay, so um, I'm a real fan of the no-dig method. Um, now I've been gardening for 
14 years or something, 15, 16, anyway. Um, <laughs> and uh, so when I started, I'd never heard of the No Dig Method. I was just looking at, I think my first book was Joy Larkham, um, How to Grow Vegetables. Very good book, really good for reference, has lots of planting spacings and things like that in. Um, and um, so I just did it the traditional way. And also I took on a plot that had four or five foot brambles for half of it and mare's tail for the other half. And um, I actually went away and while I was away, my stepdad asked his farmer mate in after he'd been to the tip a few times with the bramble tops and his farmer friend just came and plowed our plot. So it got properly dug. And um, after that, um, I was basically just, we were just dealing with lots of broken up roots of perennials that were a nightmare for about four or five years. Um, and when I heard of the no dig method, actually, it seemed to calm down those perennial weeds. They didn't seem to be so much of a problem. It just felt like mare's tail was just carrying on and carrying on, but actually per persevering with just taking it off at the surface got rid of it anyway probably much better than breaking up the roots so um i'm i'm a real convert um there are some reasons to dig compaction of the soil um now if it's in a lawn it might be a bit compacted if people have walked all over it for ages but actually you don't have to dig even in that circumstance compaction can be eased by just time and letting the creatures do it um, you might want to incorporate manure um, or compost or even lime into the soil. Now, if you've got a modern build um, and you're working in your garden and you've got that awful clay subsoil type, heavy clay soil, um, then I would suggest the first year, even if it's a small patch, get a dumpy bag of compost and try and dig it in because that soil can be improved but it needs a lot of compost um, and that will really lighten up the load. You can get a dumpy bag delivered for about 50 quid in quite a lot of council areas. Um, and it might be a lot of effort in the first year to dig that in, but I think you'll probably find that that's gonna pay you and stand you in good stead. Um, when we started, we were putting about half a ton of compost on, I would say a six meter by five foot bed roughly so actually it's you can put a lot of compost in the soil and it won't harm it so if you're going to dig at all you might as well make the best use of it you can by incorporating um compost um and if you've got a load of brambles a load of bime weed maybe um and you want to dig it out then um some of those perennial weeds can do with digging as well but i've been um on a very kind of um uh what do you call it a very correct no dig facebook page where people are doing things very purely and actually pretty much all of those things you don't have to do so if you've got a bad back um or you want to just start off protecting the earthworms and protecting the mycorrhizal fungi they're actually all of those things you could say can be coped with without digging um so reasons not to dig how much more of a list that is <laughs> um so from an environmental point of view every time you dig you release carbon into the atmosphere um carbon is stored in the soil and reacts with the oxygen in the atmosphere to cause carbon dioxide. Now we've been digging the soil since um, Roman times at least, um, and we weren't very efficient at it until we invented tractors. Um, so we have, haven't been having such a problem with the atmosphere until we mechanized digging the soil. Um, so our little patch of our allotment might not feel like we're digging on a global scale but I think we're at the point in the climate crisis where we all need to do our bit and so that is a good reason not to dig. Um, you can actually get compaction of the soil from rotivating and tractors because the the tines that go round they only go round to like here you can see my um, hands going round so um, if they're always going down to the same level 
below it is going to be compacted. So you'll have fluffy on the top and then compacted underneath. Um, like I said, some weeds benefit from having their roots broken up. Um, the mycorrhizal fungi network in the soil actually is vital to the structure of the soil. You have something called glomulin that binds carbon and makes the um, structure of the actual granules of soil. So um, by digging and killing those mycorrhizal networks, you're actually you're mixing up bacteria that's in the wrong layer. All the bacteria and fungi is in, in the correct place. There are fibers that connect things. So when you break, um, when you dig, you break those fibers and break the connections. Mycorrhizal fungi can carry nitrogen from one area to another. So if you've got a grassy path with nitrogen being held in the roots of the grass and maybe clover, then it, the mycorrhizal fungi can take it into your vegetable bed without you having to do anything. So, um, the, I mean, it does so much work for us. The soil has been developing over millennia um, and as, as, as humans has only been digging it for a short amount of time really. So I think a little bit of trust in the biological processes um, to do it for us means a lot less work for us. Um, and if you do the thing where you turn over the soil and you leave the chods to um, the frost and the rain over winter, that's been a traditional way of breaking down the soil to a fine tilth ready for spring. But if you think about that, that's actually soil erosion, isn't it? Um, and nutrients are going to be leaching out of the soil when that happens. So um, actually, when you look at the science, it's not the best thing um, for the soil. Um, another thing actually is, is I, I heard, which is a lovely little phrase and nice imagery, is if you think of um, greenery on the surface of the earth as being clothes and you take the greenery off the earth, it's like the soil is naked and it wants to get its clothes back on as quickly as possible. So as soon as you take that covering layer of vegetation off, annual weeds start growing. So um, you're going to get more weeds coming to the surface when you dig and when you expose the soil. So that's just always something to bear in mind. We'll, we'll cover quite a lot on mulches which help to um, cover the soil um, and stop those annual weeds from germinating. Okay, so have I done, oh what's happened there? Ah, there we go. Um, I'll do a little bit more on no dig and then we'll open it up to questions. So if you've got any questions in your mind now then just write them on the chat function and we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. Um, so the main thing, if you're going to do no dig, um, and that that can be from now, um, it can be next year or whatever, but actually to plan out where your beds are and where your paths are is going to be really helpful because you, if you're doing no dig, you don't want to walk on the soil you're planting in because it will cause compaction. Um, and when you're growing vegetables, you need to reach the vegetables. You need to harvest them um, and trying to stop the temptation of actually walking on the beds. So I've, we've got our paths five foot wide, our beds five foot wide. Four foot would be probably slightly better because if you think how far can you reach? If you're, if you're on your knees and you're reaching across, how far does your hand go? About two foot, isn't it? So you, two and a half foot. So that's how wide you want your beds. Um, so there's two pictures to illustrate that you've got if you've got say you've got a fence here um, where my cursor is hopefully you can see that then your bed might be up against the fence so if you do little keyhole paths going in they don't have to go right up to the fence um, but you'll be able to get in on those paths um, and like my allotment is just these beds along like that which is here um, and I've actually got paths wide enough so that we can kneel across them um, so that we're not twisting if we're um, either sowing seed or um, dibbing out weeds or anything like that. So if, you're, if you've got a bad back, that's something to bear in mind is making it so that you don't have trip hazards in the way when you're planning your bed. So actually making sure your paths are wide enough. You can do hoeing quite a lot with a no dig system if you're on top of it. So just going around and hoeing will st stop you having to lean over and hurt your back. Um, so actually getting on the ground can be a minimal thing. Um, but there are always times, aren't there, where you're going to have to be on your knees. So um, 
Right, so I think, yeah, that is that is it um, for No Digs um, method. Um, um, yeah, any questions? Yeah, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, Odile was asking about whether municipal compost was safe. Um, Jane's commented that it's a, it can be a bit hot, so spread it well before planting time. Mm, yeah, it can actually come out hot, can't it? Um, yeah, I mean, safety wise, um, it has been given an organic um, standard. So officially, it's fine. Um, I'm a little bit dubious when it's, it comes to being completely organic because of the amount of chemicals people are on their lawns and then therefore goes into the municipal compost. So, I mean, apparently the composting system helps to get rid of a lot of that. Um, when I was doing some research on peat free composts, the main thing that they were saying with municipal compost is you have variations of nutrient value, depending on whether it's from the winter, which has a lot of browns, and or from the summer when it has a lot of cut grass. Um, so I guess if you've got your municipal compost in the spring, it be, might be more likely to not have grass clippings in it, um, possibly less likely to have any long weed killers on. But I have been using it for the whole time I've had the allotment and I've never found any um, noticeable problems. Sometimes you might get a little bit of plastic in there like um that's basically somebody's thrown something in the in the bin and you find i don't know a bottle top or something that um has got mixed up with it so um but it it isn't guaranteed to be completely free of microplastics and sharps apparently but it's cheap and um it's good if people are using a waste material and putting it back on the land so hopefully the companies will step up and try and make it a little bit less likely to have sharps in um yeah yeah um a couple of people are wondering about uh raised beds versus straight in the ground in gardens um is that something you want to talk about now or mm -hmm. yeah good question because i think there's so much on the media about having raised beds that people seem to think that it has to be in raised beds. Um, but I would say the one reason to have a raised bed as in a two or three foot bed is maybe two reasons. Aesthetics, which I don't, I think that's just personal preference. And if you've got a bad back. So if you've got, um, if you've dis disabled in any way, or you're maybe protecting yourself from, making sure you're prepared for if you might be in the future and you still want to carry on growing veg, then definitely raised beds are good. The main problems with them are drying out because they're not right next to the ground. So you've got to water them so much. The compost can shrink from the edge, like sometimes settle quite a lot in the first year. So they can be a bit problematic from that. Um, we've got grass paths and wooden edges. Um, there's quite a lot of different paths types and edge types that you can get. Essentially, we went for wooden edges so that the grass didn't grow in the beds and it does work. Um, and we mow the paths and strim around the wood and it makes brilliant compost. So I'm really happy with our grassy paths, but they do take maintenance to cut them quite a lot. Um, now, if you wanted, if you've got a smaller space, it would probably be better from a slug point of view, especially if it's in your garden, to not bother with the wood. So have the sort of grass edge where you've got the edge like that and the soil is slightly lower. Um, you can do that by literally taking off the turf and that will make it slightly lower. Um, and then use like the edging shears along the edge of the grass. But because we've got a large plot, that's actually about half of it, you can see. We didn't want to go around with clipping shears um because it would just be too much work so we went for wood but the problem with wood is it does harbour slugs so we're getting a little bit more slugs every year from the fact that I've gone and planted that hedge on the far side for one thing so that's perennial um cover for them and they do like to hide around the wood um a way of getting around that it would be to use wood chip on the paths or simply just mud um, the cons of wood chip is the weeds will grow through it. So you do have to hoe it regularly. And I'm saying every week or two before they get a hold. Um, 
and the wood chip does rot down. But um, if you think of it like a long flat compost bin, um, and then every year or two, take all the wood chip off that rotted, you can actually use it on your beds then once it's compost. So there's, there's pros and cons for both things. I, we got fed up with weeding the compost because we weren't down there enough to keep on top of the weeds with a hoe. And then one of those um, across beds, across the plot, would take about 45 minutes on your hands and knees trying to get all the grass and weeds out of it. So we kind of gave up with, with, the, with the compost pass. So I've sort of covered two things there, haven't I, with um, to edge or not to edge, but hopefully that covers it all. <laughs> okay, anything else? Uh, uh, bu -bu -bu Peter makes a good point that, uh, or an additional reason to have uh, raised beds, which is that in his allotment, his allotments are prone, prone to flooding. So raised beds oh. brewing area out of the water, mm. which given that flooding is going to be something that we all need to take account of. Mm. Yeah, good point. And actually, if you've got really awful clay soil as well in a new build, that could be another reason because you're going to use, I don't know whether you'd really use less compost having a raised bed, but if the soil is really terrible, um, that could get you over it. But I think I'd be tempted to use that compost volume actually in the soil and just improve the soil that you've got. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We've got a plot um, at the bottom of our allotments that, well, actually the bottom of our allotments is level with it, but theirs goes the other way. Um, and in the winter, you put your spade in and the water table is at the surface. So they've got raised beds and that really helps. If, even if it's not flooded, it's just right at the water table. So it's helpful there. Lovely. Right, so, um, lovely. So um, I mentioned about carbon capture. I think this is just my pet subject at the moment, so I had to put a slide in. Um, <laughs> uh, I was just amazed by the amount of carbon that the soil can hold. And we can all do our bit of um, reducing our carbon footprint by putting carbon in the soil. And this year I've been quite excited by biochar, um, which is, um, in the forestry, you've got decent logs that you'll get, but you also get a load of twiggy stuff that you can't do anything with. Um, and you can also make biochar out of other waste products like woody stems of um, crops. Um, and they burn it really slowly like charcoal. Um, the difference with charcoal and biochar is they flush it with water afterwards, which apparently takes out the, um, uh, washes out the pores which makes the um, biochar able to hold on to nitrogen as well. Um, we all know, well, some of the more experienced people will know that nitrogen is water soluble and biochar will actually have a, a electronic charge that will hold nitrogen onto it, which I find so exciting. So you can um, activate your biochar by say peeing on it or mixing it with chicken um, scrapings if you have some chickens or putting it in your compost. And then it will really improve the, um, nitrogen and um, nitrogen and carbon levels of your soil but if you, I think I worked out um, how much um, I would have to put a hell of a lot of carbon in to completely offset my carbon personal carbon footprint but I just feel like getting a bag a year somehow um, makes me feel quite happy but um, the soil I think is our key to the climate problem that we're having at the moment um, if we actually just Put all the carbon back in the soil that's been lost then we'll be going some good and this is the difference between a bad soil and a good soil um, and one that is full of hummus and carbon and life on the right the, the uh, dark one and then one that's devoid of life on the on the left so we all want to be getting towards this one which is why I like the idea of improving a poor soil rather than just um, planting on top of it okay so um weeds um, this is something to um, pay attention to if you're a beginner. So um, if I've been going a bit in depth, then, um, then this is the one to um, be aware of. So field horse tail, I said at the beginning was the bane of my life to start with. This, this little guy on the left here, this funny, fluffy, asparagus looking thing, um, definitely try and get those out because that's the flowers basically and they have spores and that will be the way they propagate so do try and rip them up um essentially if you've got a, a big patch of horsetail and you don't really want to tackle it you can grow fruit bushes really quite well over it so um 
part of our allotment is a fruit cage and in recent years we've just let the horsetail just go for it in there it's a nice little place for ladybirds to hide um and moths and things it doesn't get high enough to bother the fruit at all um so it's not the end of the world if you've got horsetail but if you have just keep taking it off taking it off from the top and eventually it'll um weaken and if you are doing any digging the root is black and very brittle so just you've got to look really closely and try and get every bit out um but i kind of wouldn't I, unless you've got really bad horsetail first year try and get as much out as possible and then go for no dig after that i've seen a plot um next to next to mine um that i'd probably say that's bad enough to warrant digging so i think just use your um common sense Brambles is another one to try and get the root out. They can be really annoying brambles. So if you've got um, wild brambles on your allotment, I would say get them out if you can, or at least keep them to the boundaries. Because in one year, if they're left unchecked, they can reach like, I've, I've seen things eight meters long from one year's growth, and then they root from the end. So um, blackberries are lovely but in a small space especially you're better off with a cultivated one that doesn't go quite so rampant um, and try and get the root out if you're digging it out um, at least the nub of the the main sort of bit where you, the roots will go out from so you won't always get all of it out and you can get it out um, you can really um, weaken it by no dig method and just taking it off the top you can just get as much root out as possible and that's easier bindweed is another favorite isn't it um if you've got any perennial plants this is a right pain actually i don't find it a problem with vegetables because um if you see some it's easy enough to get it out you've not got something that's perennial that's going to tangle around the roots and be a real pain um docks essentially they have some good there's a beautiful butterfly that likes their roots they uh the seeds are actually edible you can grind them and make flour but for um, most allotmenters just basically stop them from seeding um the roots aren't too bad to get out um but just don't put it in your compost all of these things that i've just shown don't put them in your compost take them to the municipal compost um because i have heard somebody just did an experiment with some dock ones they uh, took out the dock root about yay big they put it on the fence for a year and a half and then they planted it again and it grew <laughs> so it's they're incredibly tough so don't want to have those in your compost um and ground elder luckily enough i don't have that but i have got a friend who has had it and they assured me that two years of persistent weeding did get rid of it so it's not the absolute end of the world um celandine um it's uh, got a really annoying little root um and if you've got it where you want to germinate seeds it can take over but it does die down at the end of the year so i've let some go in my herb bed and it's not doing any harm um so any that is the end of my weed bit is there any weeds that anybody has that they're having trouble with or have any comments about uh, Odile, Odile says dandelions and Richard says couch grass. Ooh, couch oh, grass. Yeah, couch grass. Oh. Um, yeah, uh, couch grass is a problem because it's just so hard to get rid of. But again, if they're annual crops, it does tend to be easier because you can, when you take the crops out, you can take the cooch out as well. And I think just keeping on top of it in a perennial place like a herb bed, it is a, a pain and I'm, I'm dealing with it. Um, if you are starting afresh and there is a, um, a grassy area, then you can actually plant... Um, comfrey in a line and actually the shade from the comfrey can stop it going through and I wish I'd done that when we first started because I think all our cooch grass is coming from the path or the road um, and going under the fence but now it's in the herb bed I'm not letting it go any further so at least it's only in one place but yeah cooch grass is a pain and dandelions dandelions are fine actually um, if you have a big one in the vegetable bed then they're quite easy to pull up um, the odd dandelion around the place i don't find a problem um, 
I don't even really that bother that much with the seed heads anymore because um, they're so good for bees and early pollen. Um, and um, I think the only problem with dandelions is if you've got a large dandelion, apparently they release a chemical that can suppress seeds from germinating. So if you've got a large one and then you've got your seed bed next to it, it's going to compete. So I take those out. So I tend to um, weed them out um, if they're a problem and leave them if they're not doing any harm because I've grown to love them really. <laughs> Yeah. One uh, interesting one from Richard, who's asking, how long should you leave a black membrane down? I'll come to mulches in a bit. I think that would be the easiest thing because it's actually not very long. Um, right. I think it's actually after making compost. So it won't be a minute. Um, so compost, I would say for all the beginners, if you want to... Um, glaze over that's fine it's, I'd say compost is an advanced thing to be honest making decent compost because it's taken me 16 years and last year when I had all the time in the world doing lockdown I finally managed brilliant compost so you know this it's it's a labor of love but absolutely brilliant if you can do it so um if you're a beginner and you want to be quick do a, um, I would say do a bay, like um, a open sided one made out of pallets. And I think I've got a picture in a minute um, because it can make really good habitat for wildlife. Um, things like hedgehogs and slow worms and grass snakes and things love, love a compost heap. You can put your seed heads in the spring in an open compost heap and all the insects, if there's any still hibernating, can crawl out. Um, if you uh, are a bit more experienced and you want to make really good compost, or if you just want to be brilliant from the beginning, um, then proper hot compost isn't really going to keep any shrews slash hedgehogs slash grass snakes happy because it gets so hot that things like that can't live in it. The things that like it are the uh, worms and um, creepy crawlies. Um, so to make really good compost, you want about 50% greens, 50% browns. Now, I did a bit of research at the beginning of the year, and actually uh, the guy who invented the Soil Association uh, back in the 40s um, would actually say 30% 30, 30 manure, 40% greens, 30, whatever it is, 30% um, browns, so that actually you can put manure in your compost and it acts as an activator, but essentially 50-50 is good. And all of those things that have been on the... Um, screen for a while are good for greens and those are good for browns um, and the reason why you want both is um, one's nitrogen and one's carbon so you want to have a good ratio of carbon to nitrogen. Browns tend to heat up more um, so if your compost goes cold you can add some grass to things. Um, browns um, will add air to the mix and stop it getting stodgy um, and will add carbon so um, when you make compost and you're making it well, chop the ingredients as small as you can. I used one of the things I think really worked this year for us was using Monty's tip of a lawnmower to chop the things up. Now, obviously, petrol probably not the best thing for carbon emissions, but it works really well. Or you can use your shears in a wheelbarrow and chop things up small. Even if you're putting your kitchen scraps in and you've got a chopping board, chop up your veg as small as you can. That increases the surface area and makes it work better. Um, layer your browns and greens, try and get as much as possible at once. If you can get a square meter at once, you're more likely to get hot compost. So I've got my bins in rotation. And so there's one I'm working on at a time. So I put everything in that one. I don't spread it out between all the bins. Um, put the compost bin in the sun. Uh, so if you see ants, it's too dry, add water. If you see slugs, it's too wet, put the lid on. Um, we covered before not adding um, the perennial weeds, but also don't add too many seeds because then that just goes on your plot again. Um, but um, turning it is the big thing that I found this year. I think I read something online that said that turning isn't necessary, so I didn't do it for a while. Um, and it isn't if you want to wait a year for your compost. But if you want to have three month compost, which I did manage, um, then turning is pretty essential so this is your low work one this is um something we've got in one of the community sites it's got a load of weed seeds in it's basically because we haven't got anything else we can do with that compost it's just put it there but actually you can see how it's made 
um, which uh, Kate showed us how to make one really well. And these posts, we use my cursor, um, are thin, oh, whoops, thin fence posts, and they slip in between a pallet. Um, so it's really easy to make a bay like this. Now you can make good compost in a bay as well. So don't let me sort of have a preference to the, um, the other ones. Um, but I would say you probably want two, maybe three bays, in which case that takes up quite a lot of space. So we go for the Dalek shaped ones and we've got four of those and I find that's fine for our plot. It's uh, our plot's 100 foot by 40 or 30, so it's quite big. Um, and I find that's all right for our, our needs, but definitely turning it is really good. And this one on the right is the compost after three months. So it is possible, it just takes time. Um, so any questions on compost come up while I was talking, Anita? Um, Paddy's asking, is ash okay for, for compost? He's burning paper and cardboard in a metal bin. Um, yeah, wood ash is fine. Um, you probably don't, uh, I, just, I think coal ash is quite specific. I think it does help as a sort of top dressing, but it needs to mature. So just go for wood ash. It's high in potash, which is potassium, which um, fruiting things like. So yeah, add wood, wood ash is fine. Um, maybe not masses, but um, a little bit is fine. Um, Thanks. Anything else come out? Okay, so um, liquid manure, um, this is something that you can do with your perennial weeds and your seeding weeds if you don't want to take them to the tip. You can put them in a big barrel and cover them in water and let them rot. Um, and it works pretty well as a, a liquid feed. Um, and my stepdad um, does this for our fruit. He has about two or three big barrels that he puts all his rubbish weeds in instead of taking them to the tip. Um, fills it with water and honestly it smells like the elephant enclosure it's disgusting <laughs> but um, he sort of presses a sieve down on it um, and then can scoop out the water um, and sometimes he just tips it out onto the uh, ground next to the fruit and the fruit I must say it really enjoys it. Um, a little bit more refined thing that you can put in is comfrey leaves or nettles and that makes a really good potassium rich feed which is on the left um, and on the right, you can see the leaves. But I would say rather than just soaking them in a bucket, um, you can actually be a bit more refined about this and do a comfrey juice maker, which takes away the smell. Um, so again, this is something that I only do well when I've got time. Um, so if you're time short or you're a beginner, then okay, um, might wanna try the bucket idea. But um, you'll basically have one bin that, oh, whoops, sorry one bin that um, has a tap on it. So uh, I, I must say I didn't put the tap on. So you've got to find somebody that knows how to put a tap in a bin. So basically you just drill a hole and put a tap on. Um, then you've got some stones in the bottom. These little blobs are stones. And then you have a bucket inside that with a crack in it. See this little bit here is just a crack. So if you've got a broken old bucket, this is, this is the one you use. Um, then you put all your comfrey in. Now, when I fill mine up, I literally fill it to the brim, sometimes overflowing, um, but just so it's in this second inside broken bucket. And then you have another bucket, preferably with a handle on it, I must say, um, that has some heavy things in like stones. And you put that on top of the leaves and it's good in the sun. It works a bit quicker, but essentially that will compress the comfrey leaves as they rot. Um, the comfrey juice will come out of the bottom here and then you can drain it off with the tap. And that makes really good feed for tomatoes, um, chilies, any of your fruit. Okay, so we're not doing too bad the time. We've got 25 minutes left. Does anybody want to know about worm compost? Can you raise your hand? It's a really good thing if you've got a small garden and you haven't got room for, right, Patrick, like, oh, lovely. Great, so Andreas, if you don't mind taking over for a few minutes and explaining about it, because I don't know anything about worm compost, so we've got Andreas to tell us about that. Hi, hi, Helen. Hi. Uh, th thanks, for, um, thanks for the introduction. 
Um, there's not much to say. It basically runs along the same principles as, as normal compost. So you're looking at 50% greens, 50% brown. Um, I've only had been doing it for about a year now. And um, it's with a borrowed compost that was um, lent to me by one of the members of Transition Town. And so basically this is a three-tiered um, plastic um, system with three trays and a bottom compartment that um, into which the, the liquid basically falls. I think the main thing to know is that um, keep it small, like you said in your composting guidance, and, and then just try to keep it not too wet and not too dry. The, the worms have to be happy and it's, they're basically doing all the work. The way I understand it when I ordered a firm from Sutton's is that um, I started with, I doubled them, you work out how much food you produce a day and then you double that and that's the number of worms that you need. So say you're doing 200 grams a day, you start with 400 worms and the worms come quite neatly from Sutton's through the post box in an envelope. So then you've got this um, sort of box of wriggly, this wriggly mass. If you, because they have to be specific worms, don't they? Yeah. So it's branding worms. Um, they're uh, they have the name. You know, they're actually they're called Asenia fetida or fetida, and and the, basically that those are worms that they they produce a um, smell if they're handled too roughly. So they like being held um, handled gently. <laughs> So I've already touched on how many worms you need. Um, choice of worm farm. Basically, you can use these off-shelf ones like this is, or you could make your own one. And that's, you basically buy three, you could buy three boxes or trays and you just um, space them apart. And then you've got the three compartments. Um, you, what you want to do is prevent any insects from, or pests from getting in and how you, if you have an off-shelf one, it, it deals with that more um, naturally, just with smaller the holes, because it needs the whole system needs to breathe. Um, and then if you you could use insect mesh on a, a on your own homemade one, for example. When you start out, don't put food straight in right at the beginning. Just put in the bedding material. And the bedding material, what I did is I basically took I think I just started with paper on the bottom of the tray. Um, then I did 20 to 50 mil of, of a coir based compost, um, or you could use coffee, grind, uh, coffee grounds or, um, or, or something like that. You can also use um, cocoa, um, what is it? It's cocoa fiber basically that you get in a brick and that you moisten up, you, you add water to it and it sort of breaks into this um, nice fibrous pulp and you can spread that in the bottom. And then you add some shredded paper and then you just put the worms in and you, you, you leave it, you may dampen it, dampen it a bit for, with water and then just leave it for a week, let the worms get acclimatized. Um, after the week, you can start adding little bits of food scraps. Um, and that's how you get started. And you just start with the top tray and as that one gets full, you basically shift it down um, and then you start filling up the next one and the worms actually worm their way up naturally. Um, they do also get into the bottom compartment where the, where the liquid um, drains into. And that's just something I've sort of, you know, I've, I've just decided I'm not gonna, because in the beginning I was, I kept take, you know, saving them and putting, putting them up to the top. And I just add, started adding scraps to the bottom section and they seem pretty happy to do that. Um, in my experience, it hasn't really got very wet. Um, in summer, when it gets warmer, they start to become more active and produce a lot more of the, the tea, the worm tea. Um, but um, in my experience, I've tried to keep it sort of not too wet. So you don't want it to be, be soggy um, because that just leads to um, the food sort of rotting. And if there's, if you're adding too much food, then that just becomes a real mess. Um, um, one, one thing to, to note is that you need, it has a, the smell of it should be quite healthy. So you don't want to, um, if, if it starts to smell sort of off and, and putrid, then that means that 
the whole system is unhealthy. It um, sounds really complicated, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm not making it very simple. <laughs> but it Anything? is actually quite simple because the worms are basically doing that turning um, mm. mechanics for you. Um, you just basically leave them and they, lead, they, re they need very little maintenance, really. Um, a question for either you, Andreas, as our worm expert, or Helen, as our compost expert, um, from Paddy, who asks, the worms are all over the inside of the lid of my compost bin plastic. Does that mean I have too much greens and wet stuff? It looks as if they're tempted, but they're trying to get away. Uh, have you got a green compost, uh, a worm composter, Paddy, or have you got a, um, a, a normal one? Uh, no, it's a, it's a normal composter. Uh, yeah, I mean, I find sometimes I end up with worms around the edges. I don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> they <don't... laughs> they might just be um, going up there to um, get away from the heat, maybe, or... Yeah, I, I, I find in my worm compost bin, um, I mean, worms are tr usually trying, if, they, if there's someone, if they're trying to get out, then there's something wrong inside the bin. It's either too hot or it might even be too cold for them. Um, yeah, it could be a number of reasons. Yeah. It could also be too wet. That's another thing. So if, um, there's, if they're on the top, maybe let's rescue them and take them away if they're in a normal garden compost one. But I think you're, you're supposed to leave the chopboard ones in, aren't you? Mm. Anita? Um, Andreas, maybe uh, it would be good if you could type the name of your special worms into the chat box when when we finished um, yeah, sure. so that people know what what to look for uh, yeah, no, let's no. asking do you need special happy worms and <laughs> yeah. special and very happy worms they need to be really happy to work properly brilliant thank you andreas <laughs> yeah, thank you <laughs> lovely right so um uh, now we come on to mulches, which was somebody's um, question earlier of how long do you need to leave membrane down? Um, now, um, I'll, I'm doing clearing mulch, clearance mulches and then grow through mulch. So there's two slightly different things um, and it depends really what you mean by membrane. So uh, membrane, I would say, is um, water porous, as in it's either woven or it's a fabric that water can get through. Whereas I rather like black plastic, um, which is silage clamps sheeting that you can get from Mole Valley. Now, if everybody's worried about um, using too much plastic at the moment. Um, obviously we need to be really careful of single use plastic and not using it excessively. But now when we throw things away in at least the Somerset and Avon region, it gets burnt in, um, uh, I can't remember where it is, Avon mouth um, to make electricity. So I have a slight level of guilt not happening there. But also to say that I've had the same bit of plastic for like about 12 years and I would say that it's going to keep going for another 20. So um, from an investment in your um, making your life easier, um, this black plastic mulch is really helpful and so I would say beginners to take note at this bit um, because um, the main reason why I'm doing these talks is to try and make it so that you have a success first year um, and you're not overwhelmed um, so if you've got a large plot actually just covering half of it in black plastic there's no harm in that it might um, actually just make it a bit more manageable for you um, the benefit of this non-water porous stuff over the normal membrane is it just works about three or four times better um, the woven stuff is quite good um, people use it in between bushes, they put holes in and plant a bush through it. That's quite good at stopping weeds. But after time, when it wears down, these little fibres, I know a friend who's found a dead bird who got a caught, foot caught in the things. And so she's totally put me off ever using that stuff. And as it degrades, those bits of fibre get stuck in your soil and they're not very nice. Um, and the other type that doesn't have the fibres is pretty useless at actually working properly. If you get cheap, it's, it's very un, um, effective, I'd say. Um, you almost need another mulch on top of it to stop it being degraded by sunlight. So I'd say the membrane type ones, are, I wouldn't necessarily recommend and then um, even under paths like wood chipping paths in a way you'd be better off just using wood chip and topping them up because the weeds just 
to grow through them. Um, and if you've got wood chip on the top, then the wood chip will turn to compost and grow weeds on top of it. So yeah, membrane, I, I probably would stay clear of um, as a sort of um, low maintenance idea because it's not quite as good as it sounds but clear and mulch is a different um, matter so what I do is at the end of the season when I've harvested my crops if it's too late to sow a green manure which I'll do in the next talk um, I'll put this plastic down um, I'll put it down when it's rained enough so that um, the soil is damp underneath because whatever you cover up will stay like that then until you need it again. So in really dry springs, I've uncovered the mulch from the winter and had damp soil. Everybody around me go, oh my God, my soil's dried out completely. It's like a crust. And yet the soil is friable and lovely. Um, I don't think it's got a problem to animals because slow worms and toads love living under it and worms and everything. So I don't think it cuts off oxygen or anything like that. Um, so I would say that that's a good thing to um, get and you can um, get it some hand off farmers if you ask them if you know somebody um, because they use it for the silage clamp. Um, so yeah I would say have a look at that if uh, a year covering something in it for a year like mare's tail or horsetail if I'd have done that for a whole year um, it pretty much kills all the perennial weeds so um, time wise. Um, a grow through mulch is a different thing a clearance mulch basically stops everything growing. A grow through mulch is something that you can do if you want to do the no dig method and you don't want to um, do so much weeding. Um, so you can actually do this on top of a lawn without even taking the grass off. Um, the secret if it is, is you need to have your cardboard overlapping. You don't have it overlapping by 20 centimetres, the grass will come through. Um, and uh, I'm actually just going to go over to the next picture, um, which is easier to see. So it only really works with plants, doesn't work with seed. So seed has to be sown directly into the soil. Um, but plants like this is say you've grown a little um, seedling and it's got a root on it. You've got your soil. This is the soil level. This is a load of weeds or grass or whatever. You've then got your cardboard that's overlapping, which will rot. It will rot within about six months. So it's only quite temporary. Um, and then you basically cut a hole in it and you plant your plant in and you cover it in some form of mulch. So here we've used fresh bark chippings on a raspberry bed. Um, which will should keep the weeds down. Um, didn't work that well because we didn't overlap the compass, uh, the, um, the cardboard well enough. But if you're going for purist no dig method, then that's a really good thing to do. But you do need to keep topping it up. And after you've been using no dig for a while, you don't need it. Um, I don't use this um, grow through mulch once, um, once my plot's established. Um, you can layer, say, a newspaper, actually, just lying newspaper on the surface of the soil. The white can reflect the light um, and it can help with bad weed problems. But the main problem with that is if light summer rain isn't going to get through it quite so easily. So, um, but yeah, to, for a sort of halfway measure, you can use a little bit of newspaper in between. Um, OK, does that cover the question that you had about uh, mulches? I think that was I think that was fine. Yeah, cool. Right. So rotation, I'm going to keep it simple um, and not go into um, complicated multifunctional rotation things and just show you this. Um, the basic four. Now, this is taken from John Seymour's Guide to Self-Sufficiency. If you look on online, there are a million different um, opinions about rotation. And for a beginner, all you really need to hear is just don't plant the same thing in the same place year on year on year, um, because you're going to have a build up of pests in the soil and that crop is going to use all the nutrients that it needs. And it's going to not use some other nutrient that another plant will use. So it will sort of be more deficient in that part of the soil. Um, so from an organic point of view, rotation really helps with pest control. Um, now, this um, rotation, I think, is quite simple to understand, I hope. So say your year one is potatoes. Obviously, you'll probably be growing all of these on every year, but say bed one or year one is potatoes. 
put manure on potatoes you can put compost but potatoes do like manure as well so if you've got access to both I always put manure on my comp uh, on my potatoes um legumes are all your peas beans um family now manure will stay in the soil a couple of years so actually it only becomes available to plants like after the second year or something uh, you know the other half of it so actually you're feeding your potatoes and your beans when you've put manure on the previous year. So you can put a bit more compost on that year because um, legumes are like, it's slightly limey. Um, and manure, when it goes on, is a little bit acidic. So not putting manure on your beans is a good idea because you're not making it more acidic. So the beans like it more. So with brassicas, you absolutely don't want to put manure on brassicas. Um, that's because um, it can actually cause club root because it can sometimes be a bit thick and stodgy. Um, brassicas roots like a little bit of air in the soil or, or just so that it's lighter and not um, gonna hold fungus. Um, and they also like it a little bit limey. So don't put manure on your brassicas. You know, it's two years ago you put manure on your potatoes, so you don't have to worry. Put a bit more compost on for your brassicas. And then your roots like um, carrots and parsnips, you don't need anything because if you put too much nutrient in the soil, they'll fork, um, especially parsnips. So don't put any compost on parsnips. Carrots, actually, I have put a bit of mun municipal compost on and they quite liked it. Um, roots can also include onions and um, beetroot. I don't tend to do a lot of composting for beetroot. I don't think they really need it, um, but I would probably put manure on onions and leeks. Um, so um, I have got a slightly more complicated one with onions and um, alliums on as a separate um, section in the notes that are available online. Um, but, you know, I think with roots, uh, with um, alliums, you can kind of fit them in anywhere. And actually, if there's a patch of your garden that they really like, then they're the one thing that you don't have to rotate as much. Um, apparently the sulphur from brassicas in the roots, um, the uh, onions like, the onion family likes, it sort of prevents white rot a bit, and the nitrogen that legumes leave in their roots afterwards, the brassicas like. So that's why you have it in that rotation, because the one previous leaves something that the next one likes. So, um, but from a, a, just a really simple point of view, if you start off with these four, Anything else can be slotted in anywhere. So courgettes, squash, um, all your sort of succulents, um, like the frost tender things like tomatoes, just put them in everywhere, anywhere, but just try not to put them in the same patch every year. Um, okay. So does that, is that sounding okay? So I know that we're five to eight now and I don't want to uh, get stuck on anything. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so now we get the good bit really, isn't it? I think this is the bit everybody wants to know about is the actually growing vegetables. So we're February, um, it's cold outside. You won't want to be planting your potatoes until at least middle of March, but you can start chitting them. So if you've got your seed potatoes, um, you can put them in egg boxes or you can um, put them in a big tray and just have them next to each other so they stay upright. Um, put them on a windowsill indoors. Um, and they'll grow these little sprouts. And um, it's just a way of getting them started. Um, it's not totally necessary, but I know that the mail order company that I go with, which is King's, delivers them in January. And if I didn't do this, they go all um, really long sprouts before I'm ready to do them. So it's a good way of holding on to your potatoes. Um, now a potato is a stem tuber. So actually that's not the best diagram ever, but you have a, your seed potato at the bottom and then all the other potatoes grow above it and then you get the leaves on the top. So this is how I plant my potatoes in a no dig way. Um, you digging, no dig is also known as minimal till so it's fine to dig a hole with a trowel, I'm not turning over the whole soil. So uh, this trowel is nicely six inches long from the tip to the handle so you can see that potatoes in the soil about six inches. So I just lay them out. They're about a foot and a half foot apart. Um, yeah, they're about a foot apart because they're uh, salad ones. Um, and then just pop them in the hole and cover it over. And that's all you need to do until 
um, well, for a good month or so. Um, and they will pop up little um, leaves like that on the surface. And then you need to earth them up, which is where you, there's two different ways of doing it. If you're doing no dig, this is kind of borderline whether you're digging or not. You can use a draw hoe um, and pull the soil from the outsides. If you've got um, quite a lot of mulch on the surface, you're not really digging. Um, but um, you can also put more compost on top and just form a ridge, but you've got to have a lot of material for that. Um, it's a really good idea to cover up the ground with fleece, like old horticultural fleece or net curtains because this one on the right, you can see that late May frost, how much it got my potato leaves. So um, I actually plant my potatoes in mid-March, um, cover them in fleece, leave it on until about May. Um, I take it off to earth them up um, and that's a really good way of protecting them. Um, when it comes to harvesting them, you've got blight to watch out for. Um, this is actually a more rare than people maybe say. Um, because the leaves will die down anyway. But if they get looked like this, um, and very quickly, two days, they can really start looking horrendous. Pull all the tops off, um, wait two weeks before you harvest your potatoes because the fungus will stay on the surface um, and actually will um, not, be, um, not infect the potatoes after two weeks. But if you leave it, it'll go down the stem and affect the potatoes. So as soon as you see something really dodgy, like your leaves are melting um, in two days, like not just a general dying back, then take them out and take them down the tip. But um, you can start harvesting your potatoes once they start flowering. And with the no dig method, you can actually not dig your potatoes. Um, I did try this this year. I sort of rooted around with my hands like this on the left hand picture, all of these ones, all this lot, I got out of the ground without digging. And then I went back over and to be honest, I could have maybe made a bit more of an effort as well with my hands. I went back over a whole plot and that's all I got out with of turning it all over. So um, it is possible to get pretty much all your potatoes out just shuffling around in your hands because the soil at the top is light and friable. Um, so any questions about potatoes? Yeah. Two questions. Uh, one from Andreas who says, when you earth up potatoes, do you put the soil over the leaves or let them throw shoot, thro show through? Um, and the other question was much earlier from Paddy, who said that for every seed potato, he's getting about six to eight spuds. And he wants to know, is that normal or rubbish? Because it seems to him to be quite rubbish. Um, the first question was, yes, cover, uh, cover up the leaves. Um, they will just grow through. Um, I tend to earth them up until the point where the slope is um, integral that it won't hold anymore. So there's a point where you can't really earth them up anymore. Um, and um, Paddy's point about um, five or six potatoes kind of depends on the size of potato. If they're five or six massive great big potatoes, then that's kind of what I get. Um, if they're five or six tiddlers, then I would say you're just not feeding them enough. They need more manure. So um, uh, get manure or compost in volume um, because it might be that your soil's just not rich enough. Um, vegetables are really hungry plants. So um, I don't think you can ever put too much compost on. Um, so parsnips, um, I've cracked parsnips, yay. Um, parsnips, the main problem with them is germinating. They can be a right pain. Um, and I, one year, I was always used to do them quite early. And one year I did them a bit later and I put a bit of fleece over them. Ah, oh, it worked a dream. So these are my parsnips last year, really good um, germination row. And that's the fleece that I just laid on the ground. They're an old dodgy bit of fleece that you got left over from somewhere. Um, and this is how I sew them. So taking off the black plastic, it takes no more than a rake to make this um, fine till. Um, then I make an a impression in the soil using the trowel um, and then I pour water in it. So watering the ground before you put the seeds in because you can pour loads in them. Um, and once you've got your, um, this is hard to see because obviously it's just brown, but once you've got your oh, thing um, and put your seeds in, you see those, I don't know whether you can see those seeds, but they are about an inch apart 
crumble a bit of soil on top to so literally crumble it over so that they're hidden and then cover it up in your bit of fleece. And I think that that works for many reasons. I think it stops the birds eating the seed. It provides a nice warm environment for them to germinate. It traps a bit of water in. So when you get the heat of the day, it condensates on it and then it just goes back on the soil. So um, I find I just lift it up every um, week, maybe more um, to maybe give it some water, but hard, hardly even any watering. Um, and that's the same method that I use for all of my sowing seeds in situ now. And I find it works really well. Um, I'm aware of the time. So um, if anybody has any questions at any point, just raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I will just keep going. Is that all right? Um, <laughs> so onions. Um, the picture on, well, having a look at this one, this is an onion set. So you've got a pointy end and a sort of flat rooty end. Sometimes it's even got roots coming up. Oh, did you have a question, Odile? You can just um, unmute by pressing the space bar, if you like. Yeah, yeah, this is not Odile, um, but okay. um, yeah, I'm Odile's husband, uh, Kim. But um, can, we use, can we use a bubble wrap for fleece? I wouldn't because it's going to be not water permeable. So um, the the beauty of fleece is it lets light and water flow through, whereas bubble wrap wouldn't. It wouldn't let the water through. Um, I'd also be a little bit concerned about damping off, which is where it gets too wet underneath. Um, so uh, horticultural fleece you can either get from a garden centres, um, you can buy it on big rolls, or you can ask a farmer for some second hand. Um, and um, because they tend to only use it for about three years before they chuck it out. Um, okay. But yeah, you can, you can use it yourself. It probably lasts about five years and it's one of those kind of borderline plastic things. It doesn't last as long as the black plastic. Um, but I have heard that they're making an eco-friendly version out of fleece. I'm not quite sure where you source it, but if you, you can get proper horticultural fleece made out of wool these days. Um, but it's, it's a good investment actually, because you can, what I tend to do is use it on my brassicas the first year or two or three until it's got holes in it. Um, and then I'll use it on the ground. So I've always got some rotation of like how bad it is. And then when it gets completely covered in mud and it looks horrendous, I'll throw it out. Um, <laughs> so um, that's all right. <laughs> so onions, again, you can cover onions in fleece lying on the ground because the problem with these is the birds pick them out um so they'll pick the little onion sets out but you want to plant them in the ground so they're half in half out so that their tops are sticking out um and i'm actually gonna cheat and go down a few slides uh, 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 to that one so on the right here i really like sewing them in modules because you get a little bit of root here and you can use your secondhand rubbish compost. You don't have to be um, spend, getting your expensive compost in the modules, but um, just getting them to root a bit before you plant them really works well um, at stopping the birds from eating them. So back up, there we go. Um, so you'll essentially get three problems with um, onions, which is white rot, rust and mildew. Um, I'm afraid I get all of it. Um, rust and mildew is just airborne. It depends on the weather. White rot is in your soil anyway. Um, though I think you can actually sometimes import white rot from onion sets. Um, but I still find I get a harvest. So um, I must say I don't worry about these things particularly. Um, they only ever seem to come in patches. The rust and the mildew doesn't really have a problem apart from in 2012 when it didn't stop raining um, and then it was a problem. But normally it's just sort of surface stuff and it doesn't really matter that much. OK, so broad beans, these you can sow now. So you can sow them inside in modules and you can plant them out as plants. They essentially just need some support. That's about it. They need some compost. Um, you can plant them about six inches apart, have a little bed, give them something to um, grow up. And the only real problem with broad beans is black fly. And you can see this guy's pinching out the tops. And also you can see how high they get. So actually that's quite a high plant, isn't it? Um, so if you've only got containers, there are dwarf types that you can get. And I just think these are absolutely brilliant. I haven't grown them in pots myself, but um, to actually get a dwarf plant in a pot is gonna be a lot more helpful because they're not gonna fall over. 
Okay. So leeks you can sow now. Um, these are little cute little leek seeds. They're so sweet, aren't they? Like a little bit of grass. Um, but you can just clear away a square foot of soil. Sow a packet of leek seeds or maybe half a packet. Um, and they, you can cover them up in a bit of fleece if they're outside or you can um, leave them in the polytunnel. Um, and what they'll do is they'll grow, these are actually spring onions in this picture because um, I didn't have a good picture of the leeks, um, but they look just the same as spring onions. And once they get to a sort of pencil thickness, which mine were a bit thin this year, actually, I think it was the drought, um, I'm going to blame that. Um, then you just dip off hole in the ground with some well we use a uh, iron pole and the ground's so friable actually because we're not not digging it's it's lovely consistency you can just pop the pole in you create a little dip you pop the thing in and you water it and you don't have to do anything else they're really easy they're quite high yielding i don't find i get the problem with white rot on leeks um very rarely um and i think that is partly because i'm growing them from seed so i am tempted to grow onions from seed um, stop importing it on the sets and um, these ones in the pot are ones that I gave away I'd say they're probably the smaller ones because <laughs> I'll give away the smaller ones don't you okay so peas you can sow these now as well I really like um, root trainers um, I think they're a good investment I've struggled with using um, toilet roll inners I find they fall apart and um, they're not really actually that practical um, so on the buying quality plastic, if you're going to buy any, then these root trainers are pretty good. And you can see that the uh, roots are um, growing up inside. And when you take them out, you don't disturb the roots. Um, and another thing that you can do is plant them in a drain pipe and just pop them straight in. But I think this time of year, grow your peas in a, inside on a windowsill or something like that and get them into little plants. And then by March, they'll be ready to um, plant out. And you can also sow them in situ. You can see that, um, that last year, this is a succession of sowing. Um, I'll, get, I'll hold on, I'll, I'll get to your question in a minute. Um, there's a succession of sowing here. So here on the left are the ones that I started in pots um, early in, I think it was late February. And then these here are ones that I've um, sowed in situ um, and they've carried on. Um, and the same way as I sowed the parsnips, I just make a trough, water it, sow the seeds, and they grow up and you've just basically got to give them something to grow up. I quite like these um, metal things that I've scavenged from a, somewhere held up with bamboo canes. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember your actual name, but oh, Dale, what did you want to ask? What to, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, you said it can also be sown in situ, but, but when? Um, I would wait until March. So if you're going to do anything now before the next talk, I would do the peas in modules um, inside because if you they are pretty hardy um, bit peas. You can probably plant them out mid to late March if it's not too cold and you can actually protect them with fleece. Um, but if you plant them out too early, they just do struggle and sit there for a bit. Um, and with um, ones that you're planting straight in the ground, I'd wait until the ground warms up again. Um, if you can sit on the ground and it doesn't make your bum really cold, then it's probably warm enough for the seeds. <laughs> Good roll of thumb. Okay. Thank you. Um, so spring leaves. Um, I'm so sorry I'm going over, but hey. Um, anybody that needs to leave, then that's fine. I won't hold you to it. <laughs> I just get carried away. Um, so spring leaves. Um, uh, there's so many different sorts of leaves that you can grow. And um, there's two different ways, really. Cut and come again or growing it into a big plant. Um, cut and come again is really great if you've got a small space or a pot. Um, growing it into a bigger plant, you've got a little bit more um, chance you're going to get slugs in them um, and open it up and there's a slug. But also, if you do cut and come again and you forget to harvest some, then you'll probably get one hearting up. So um, I go a bit flexible with that. The lettuce is also brilliant planting in between other stuff. So you can see I've got my squash in. This is quite a lot later on in the season. Um, and I've planted out my um, lettuce. Um, and here it's sort of dotted in around. There's a, there's a courgette there. 
um, and some flowers and bulbs and things and a poppy. So you can just pop your lettuce in any way you like. Um, but I'd say the ground is still too cold to sow them outside. So you can just plant them in, in pots. Um, this picture at the bottom here, you've got two different sorts of things you'll use as salad leaves. This is lettuce. It's got a little round leaf. And this is a brassica leaf, which is so recognizable once you start um, looking at them, these two little heart-shaped leaves. Um, I really like proper spinach rather than chard, as in, I can't remember what they call it. Chard is also known as perpetual spinach, but um, it's tougher and I don't like the taste as much. Like normal proper spinach is really nice to grow early because it's quite hardy. If you sow it now, then you should be able to plant it out in like late March. Um, it crops really early, so it helps with that hungry gap and it freezes really well. So you can wilt it down, put it in balls and put it in your freezer. Um, so I'm still eating my springtime um, spinach. I don't bother with it later in the year because it just bolts. And if you're interested, that beautiful one there is inter red cos. So I-N-T-R-A, inter. Might not have the R in it. Um, okay. Any questions about seeds? Um, so I was just going to say about actually about seed sowing. Um, I found the best peat free organic compost in the world is um, Dalefoot compost. Um, I'm actually going to be emailing the um, Allotment Association people about that soon um, because um, you can get a group order. Um, it's cheaper if you buy more than 50 bags, but um, from a completely clean, completely chemical free, um, made in in the UK it's not flow miles it's not destroying our peat bags uh or bogs it's it's just the best compost so really love that stuff um when you're sowing seeds and also I've got here about garland products if you want to write that down I don't think I've got it in the notes online um is these seed trays I've decided now that if I'm going to buy them I want to buy quality ones that will last ages so they've got a 10-year guarantee and they're made from 100% recycled plastic you can use things like in this small picture, like old um, yogurt pots and things like that. And it does work. It's just if you're doing a lot, it's a faff. You've got all different sized things and it's harder to water and they don't grow quite as well. So actually getting some good um, equipment at the beginning is quite handy. Um, and just put the compost in the tray, pat it down, soak it. Um, you can sow your seeds um, in little sort of just use your finger and do little drills and again like the other one I quite often crumble a bit of compost on top um, there's a good rule of thumb as it's a small seed don't cover it in too much compost so one of the um, this is actually something for beginners to take note um, is potting on is really quite important um, this is kind of the difference between you having healthy plants to plant out and not. Um, they get to a point when they've used up the compost in their pot and they're not going to get any bigger. So you've just got to move them on, give them fresh compost. So um, third picture along, you can see I'm just taking out some grass that's grown. Um, and you just pick out a little plant, make a little well in the compost, put it in, tap it down um, and water it. It's not complicated it's the sort of thing you learn instinctively um, so it's just I think time wise that's the thing that can sometimes stum stum stumbling block when you're working full time is actually oh I really need to move those seeds on and it's another week or two before you do but um, that's something to um, try and have in mind um, if you can possibly pot them up and not let them wait too long okay so we can sow tomatoes, chilies, aubergines and peppers on our, for our windowsills. I like my upstairs bathroom windowsill, it works really well. So we can do that now. And in fact, that's the first thing I do when I get, I'm gonna do when I get my compost. Um, these are the most important, I think, to start off early. Um, however, when you've got your tomatoes, they need somewhere to go and they might end up getting leggy if they stay in too long. So, Start thinking now about where these seedlings are gonna go if it gets um, uh, frosty. Uh, this is a hot box, which is a bit of an advanced technique, but it's actually done by the Romans. So what it is, is these two sides here are pallets, and then you put um, fresh manure in. So you need to have a farmer or a friend that has fresh manure in quantity. So you wanna have a two foot 
height of fresh manure, then six to eight inches of compost. Then you put your yeah, little pots and things on top where you can grow lettuce, and then you put a cold frame over the top. So actually, it's a really nice method to know about. Um, we've done it a couple of times and it has worked well. Um, it doesn't have the requirements of heating. You can then use the manure to do something else. It's good if you haven't got any electricity to have a heated um, propagator. However, we now do this because it's easier. <laughs> so um, we've got a polytunnel. How lucky are we? The hot box is really good if you haven't got a polytunnel. Um, this is horticultural bubble wrap. Can't use normal bubble wrap because it disintegrates into a million pieces and it's a right uh, microplastics problem. So if you invest in horticultural bubble wrap, you only really need this March to May. So you're only using it for two months. So it doesn't actually get that damaged. So just take it off, put it away, bring it out the next year, it will last ages. We've basically just got one side of our shelving. We've put this old bit of water pipe, put two sides on, and then one piece that goes all the way around, it goes underneath as well. Um, and then a flap to just pull down and it's just stapled on. Um, with a staple gun um, and that will put in in a closed polytunnel or greenhouse with this second layer of protection that will stop your tender plants from getting frostbitten because it's so annoying when you've sown them in January and you've been or February and you've been like holding on to them for them to die. Jane do you have a question? Helen how, how are you keeping the slugs out of that? If you've got fresh manure there's usually slugs in there do you mean the hot box? Yes. I used the nematodes was really good. Okay. Um, it, it wasn't too bad for slugs, but the second year I did it, I got ants. Um, okay. And I did the ant nematodes and that worked as well. Um, I also found I got a mouse in there <laughs> um, that started eating my lettuce because I think because it was warm and it was winter. Yeah. It was a nice mouse hole. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the nematodes worked really well for the slugs and the um, ants. Okay, so um, have that on standby. Yeah. Bang. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, it is, it's, a, it's a nice thing to play with the hot box. Like, it's a good experiment. It's quite exciting if you end up being able to sew things successfully at that if, time of year. If you've been to Charles Dowding's, he's, he uses them. And, um, but yes, I, I'm just convinced I would have slugs crawling out of the compost and eating all my seedlings. I think with them um, all um, cold frames, um, like if you haven't got a greenhouse or um, a, a polytunnel, it, it's a good thing to make one and you can just use old windows and things like that. I think they need vigilance of checking under the pots quite regularly and just checking that there's no slugs in there. Um, I think I ended up finding a snail in this thing last year and I was like, what is eating my things? And then found <laughs> a great big snail. It's like, And it's raised off the ground as well. How did it get in there? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think this is the last bit of plants is celery. Now it does need a bit of heat to germinate. So if you've got a heated propagator, then that's good. But they do take ages to germinate and ages to grow. So um, it is handy if you can start them off a little bit sooner. Um, and you can also sow flowers now as well. So I've just got oh, tr fruit trees. Um, the winter is the best time to plant fruit bushes and fruit trees. Um, if you've got a tree, dig a square hole, better than a round hole. If you've got blueberries, they definitely need ericaceous compost. But essentially, if you fancy doing any fruit, now's the time to plant it. You need to plant it really before the end of March. Otherwise, it'll just need loads of watering. Um, and if you've got a small space like a garden, I'm not going to go into it now because it's too complicated, but have a look at forest gardens online. Um, and um, it's essentially a way of planting a tree and fruit bushes underneath um, and different things that all work together. So for a small garden space, it can be a really um, space efficient way of growing that, uh, fruit. Um, and when it comes to pruning, um, this time of year, before March, you're looking at apples and pears being the things that you prune. Uh, trees with a stone in, like plums, cherries, you wait until the sap's risen. So you wait until after April. Um, and pruning is a massive uh, subject people get a bit scared of, but essentially just work around your tree systematically. Always cut right at the nub where it's growing out. Um, or if you're cutting above a bud, 
then cut just above the bud because these little nubs have natural antibacterial stuff in them. Um, and if it's got a long piece for the bacteria at the end to go, oh, and develop and make loads until it gets the antibacterial thing, it's going to be more of a problem. You cut it off right where the nub is, the bacteria will go in and go, oh, no. OK, I won't go any further. So um, cut them right down to the bottom. Where you've got branches rubbing together, choose which one you like best and take off the other one. And obviously anything broken. Um, and then when it comes to where the buds are, if you want to take it down at all, look for an outward facing bud and cut above it. So just look, because that bud is going to create a branch in the direction it's pointing. And you want a nice open goblet shaped tree. So I'd say those four things, if you go around systematically, it's just a bit of a beginner's touch on it. But it, the, to be honest, the best way of learning is being with somebody that knows what they're doing and will show you on a one-to-one -one basis, um, which I was lucky enough to have. So I definitely recommend that because it doesn't go in, I don't think, until you've actually done it, um, maybe even twice. Okay. So I realise I've gone way over time. I'm sure we probably all want to um, go now, but um, I'll just flick through some of the flowers that are possible. Um, planting flowers will really help with pollination, aphids, on the protecting crops point of view, putting a nice fence up round if you're in the middle of the countryside and you might get rabbits or badgers um, is a good idea. Um, I don't find pigeons are a problem actually, or other birds. Uh, I've got loads of birds down the allotment. I don't really find they're a problem. I think the only time that they do is brassicas that are overwintering, they have a nibble at and I cover them in fleece and they're fine. Um, Mice, I think they just eat peas. If you try and sow peas and beans over the winter, they just eat them. <laughs> um, we covered slugs earlier. Anita, was there any interesting slug information on the chat? Well, okay, so there's two things. One on peas. Uh, Nikki says, if you sow peas direct, you can put holly leaves in the trench with them to deter mice. Wow, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and the other one on slugs was uh, Paddy saying that he's got a lot of um, little round uh, three millimetre sort of eggs. Are they slugs? Yeah. They Squish them if you don't want slugs. Yeah. Um, I quite like the slug off stuff. You can pile it around a plant and it dries out their slime as they try and go over it. Now, um, I, f I find slugs a bit of a... Um, I, I think I've grown veg and stuff for long enough and lost enough things to have a mild hatred for slugs. But then I'm also, I suppose I should really not be killing them because of the hedgehogs and the slow worms and stuff, but I don't have hedgehogs and slow worms. So there's nothing to eat them in my garden. Um, so I must admit, and please don't hate me, I do chop them in half with a pair of scissors. <laughs> she can look away and it's really fast. And I do care about things feelings. So I figure it's very quick and <laughs> it's totally disgusting, but hey, it's not any chemicals, it's efficient. So, you know, shoot me now. But yeah, I think just generally killing slugs at any available opportunity, especially squishing their eggs is, there's gonna be a million slugs. I don't think they're endangered. <laughs> is that all right? <laughs> okay, um, and the cats wise, cats, oh. They like a freshly dug bed, don't they? Like nice seed bed. These little guys on the right, this thing um, with the curse around, these are cat deterrents that are motion sensors. They're about 11 quid. They cover about two square meters, but actually they're really good. They're the thing that worked in this bed that I said. The, the netting twigs doesn't work. Fleece works if you lie it on the ground and you weigh it down. So that does keep cats off. This is what somebody else um, showed as they were using, which is like builder's netting. If you make a little tunnel for them like this, like I did for about five minutes until my cat started playing in it, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, Ollie? Sorry. Uh, do they keep birds off as well? Yeah, fleece is good at keeping birds off. Um, I mean, especially pigeons. Um, I think if you if you use anything to keep birds off, 
do really seal in all the sides. Don't sort of have a half-hearted bird deterrent because if they get in and then they can't get out, then you're going to kill the birds. Um, so fruit cages and things, we actually find that the little birds, we've seen blue tits and stuff, they'll go flap, 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 and then pull it and they'll go through a hole. <laughs> And then flat the inside, it's crazy. So in um in a fruit cage, you do need to have um small holes, like um sort of inch holes. Um when it comes to brassicas, uh, the only thing that keeps off everything is fleece. Now um I've tried netting. If a leaf touches the side of the netting, which I've you've how how difficult would it be not to? The butterfly will lay through the leaf, uh, through the netting. So it'll just press it onto the side and the butterfly do it. I'm sure I've seen them dive bombing eggs on these things. You know, they, they, you need like a complete coverage. Um, well, and I think we've-, we've What about that, that electric thing? Is that, is that effective on birds? I don't think so, but I don't know. I know it's for cats. I think it's it has a high pitched noise and I find it not pleasant, but I've sort of got used to it. Um, as you get older, you can't hear it because you lose the really high pitch ability to hear. Um, but cats um, really find it annoying. I don't have no idea about birds, to be honest. Do you have a particular problem with birds or any particular type of bird on any particular crop? Well, we've just planted a cherry tree. So in a, in a few years time, we'll be thinking about that. Um, I think probably unless you want to have it netted all the time in a fruit cage, then wait until the cherries are nearly ripe and then net it really well. Like even if you cover the whole thing and tie it at the trunk or just if it's a massive cherry tree, cover one branch and tie it because um, the birds will have a field day on cherries. So it'll be who gets there first. Um, so but having something propped up all the time. I think there's a nice picture. So, where, oh, the, there's my brassicas. So these are like the little, oh, I'll go back. Where, um, where was it? It was in peas. Sorry if anybody hates flicking. Uh, where is it? It was in beans. I had a really nice picture of a little tripod and they'd put, um, maybe I didn't include it. It's annoying. Right, turn away if you don't like flicking, I'm going to go back. But I saw a really nice way of um, uh, doing a fruit bush where he did a little teepee of canes and then had the um, thing around a pot of a fruit bush. That looked really quite nice. Um, so these are my little pods that I do for brassicas. So I'm lucky enough to have these little metal hoops that I got given. Um, but you can just make these out of anything really but the, um, this is like uh, plant support steel uh, galvanized and then these bits of fleece are two meters by two meters which is perfect size for four to six brassicas um, and you just weigh them down all the way around the edge and that keeps off everything pigeons um, flea beetle caterpillars it doesn't keep off slugs and because they're not accessible to birds the birds can't eat the slugs um, and generally, I think this is pretty much right at the end of my talk now, is aphids um, aren't, aren't a problem, I don't think, if you've got a healthy ecosystem. So if you go loads of flowers and actually the, you can grow sacrificial aphid plants that then raise enough of their predators to then be there the next year. So I found a verburnum, uh, the snowball bush. It's really good for black fly. Um, and I've had loads of ladybirds now that are going to that bush. And so I never have any problem with aphids and blue tits eat them as well. Um, so when it comes to um, companion planting, there's so many, if you, uh, just check out this chart. I just put this there to show you how complicated it is, <laughs> is that this was just found online. If you look up companion planting and look at the images, it will be one of the first things that comes up. But there's so much different um, advice about companion planting. If you want to get into it, it's far more than this talk can be. It would need its own talk in itself. I think just essentially just grow flowers and have some bushes and try and have a habitat for the things that eat all the pests and then you won't have a problem. Um, so I think that's it. Ta-da!
sorry, half an hour over. How horrendous. <laughs> I think that's the latest I've ever run <laughs> in eight years. So sorry about that, guys. Um, so next talk's on the 16th of March. So if anybody has any general questions, then um, just let me know. Go for it. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. And speaking as a complete novice gardener, I always find you so inspiring and uh, just really encouraging, actually. Just give it a go, I guess, um, and learn as you make mistakes. That's my that's my takeaway anyway. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, and just thanks to everyone for coming along. We've had so many people here that normally wouldn't be able to get to one of your talks. So we will, we have been recording this We'll put it up on a YouTube um, and share that with everyone. Uh, and if anyone wants to download Helen's extremely comprehensive and good notes, just go to the Transition Town website and look under the food group. You'll see organic vegetable growing there and you can download from there. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for coming everyone. I'm sorry I overran so much, but really lovely to have such good attendance and so many people coming. That's really lovely.